today I've got Larry with Montana Audubon. Welcome, Larry. Thank you, Bill. So let's uh, start with the high view. Well, let's start. It's almost spring. I had my <laughs> yoga instructor said she saw three bluebirds. <laughs> oh, that's great. So there's the bird story of the day. <laughs> so with that as a starter for birds, tell us about Montana Audubon. Well, um, you know, Montana Audubon is tied to Audubon, and usually people think of Audubon, they think of birds, and for good reason. Um, it's interesting, in Montana, the, I was doing a little history on this, and George Bird Grinnell, who actually helped start Glacier National Park, mm -hmm. started Audubon. And so there is a tie to Montana, and uh, Audubon has been really behind a lot of legislation. Actually, we're celebrating the 100-year history of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and so Believe it or not, it all started against fashion, women's hats. <laughs> uh, so women were walking through cities like New York with all these birds in their hat, and uh, people were concerned about killing birds for fashion, so they started this Audubon Society. Now here in Montana, uh, we're at our 42nd year, so we've been around for quite a while. Our legislation has really been in Helena. Uh, we got uh, early victories like Back in the 80s, we passed the checkbox. I know people are doing their taxes now, but you can check off for non-game. That was uh, legislation that we got passed in Helena so that uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, I'm sorry, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks could have uh, funding for non-game. So that doesn't come to us, but it was one of our early policy work. So, so we've mm -hmm. been around for 42 years. Okay, so that's not one of your funding sources. Tell us about <laughs> the ones that are your funding sources. Um, yeah, we uh, un unfortunately we don't get any regular funding from the state or, or, or the feds. Uh, all our funding mainly comes through individual donations. So uh, it really is the people who are passionate for birding and bird watching and our work in science and policy and education that, that keep us going. Mm -hmm. And you were new to Audubon, <laughs> six months or so we yeah. decided. Yeah. So what's your background? Well, I've always loved birds. Um, well, probably at least half my life I've spent watching birds. Um, but I, I started off in the East Coast and worked in New England. Uh, my first job with Audubon was actually in Vermont, and uh, I was a state education director uh, working on science and education projects. Um, but eventually moved on to Oregon and spent 10 years. Uh, we started the first children's forest in the Northwest, and um, that's an outdoor classroom of 1.2 million acres of uh, outdoor classroom for kids. Uh, so I've always had a passion for education, a passion for birds. Uh, and this opportunity came up to live in Montana, and mm -hmm. uh, it's beautiful here, and it seemed like a perfect fit. You came in probably one of our biggest winters of, <laughs> of the last decade, I what believe. What a welcoming. <laughs> yeah. We were in Missoula, and it's all pretty much green and no, no snow, and we come back to still having foot on the foot of snow on the ground, so <laughs> welcome to Montana. Thank you. Everyone tells me it's unusual <laughs> it winter, is an unusual so I'll winter. believe them. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to take their word for it. Yeah, so, um, so what does is, what is Audubon do to connect sort of birds and people and outdoors? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the biggest things we do is every year we have a festival, and uh, this year it'll be in Kalispell. Um, this is a two-day festival where we go bird watching. I mean, believe it or not, we get up early, we, we have 25 field trips, we gather birders from all over Montana and beyond even, um, and we spend time enjoying birds and, and getting people out uh, I into the field. Uh, we're gonna be in Kalispell this year on June 8th through the 10th, so we have a lot of field trips to Glacier National Park where mm -hmm. George Bird Grinnell is <laughs> tied to Audubon. Um, and other places, we have a real community presence. In Billings, we have our main center, uh, the Audubon Center, and we reach 25,000 people a year with programs on birds, also a lot of children through our classroom programs. Uh, we have a preschool there as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So a lot of our energy is in Billings simply because we have uh, a center there, but we're actually thinking of expanding beyond Billings. Mm -hmm. Let's just talk about that briefly because I have visited that facility <laughs> and, and if someone from Helena were passing through, <laughs> it's really easy to get to yeah. and it's really rewarding to walk around in it. So let's talk about the experience just a little bit. It's just south of which interchange? It's I don't the remember. South Billings. So south yeah, Billings. when you get off that inter and it's a beautiful site. I've been to it a number of times. A lot of our, our staff are split in this state between Helena where we do our policy and science all our education staff are at that center. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a great thing. I think I've worked a lot on connecting youth to the outdoors and, and actually all ages to the outdoors as a park ranger as well. This is an opportunity in a place like Billings where those folks don't maybe not have as many opportunities, a place to go out, I mean, literally from pre-K to adult, you can experience the center. So like I said, we're serving 25,000 people. 
And uh, we're sort of, in a way, when you think about the fabric of Billings, we're, we're part of that fabric, along with the library and the zoo. Uh, we're a way that people can um, sort of create a culture of conservation in their own backyard. Uh, I think it's a great model. It's, it's difficult to run a center. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. I can tell you it's expensive. So we're looking at that being sort of the hub for all our education. We've now reached almost every fourth grader in Billings. We are in almost every classroom. So now we're thinking of expanding to possibly Helena, Great Falls, other cities that maybe don't have a center like Audubon, uh, that maybe we can bring our programs to those places. Mm -hmm. I know as an adult, I've stopped in there just <laughs> traveling through, and I wanted to break. I wanted to get out and walk, and it's right beside the river. Yeah. And I was there when there was class, and it's fun <laughs> to watch these kids <laughs> with binoculars yeah. and clipboards <laughs> and knowing that they're going to go out and walk around on the trails and get to experience not only nature but also be able to catalog birds yeah. and have a guide out there. It's, it's a great experience. Well, you know, kids have a natural curiosity. I mean, this mm -hmm. is what my own daughter who's nine. I mean, she'd rather spend all day with me outside, but sometimes we get so tired as parents, we're like, just take an iPad. But mm -hmm. that natural curiosity to go and do Google search and, and things like that, I'm only look it up. I, I say, don't Google it. Let's go find out for our answers for ourselves. That's the same curiosity that draws kids to birds and wildlife in general, wanting to see a grizzly bear. It's that same curiosity. So I think in Billings, and what I'd like to see us have to do across the state is change channel that curiosity into uh, a passion for the outdoors, not a passion for, for screens, but a passion for bark and leaves and things you want to touch and feel and experience. That's natural in children, so we, mm -hmm. we need to be careful how we <laughs> engage them. <laughs> right. I mean, I think it's nice that there is a center there in Billings, but in so many ways, we have the experience just waiting for us to right, go out right. there. We just happened to be on, in Great Falls to go <laughs> biking last fall. And yep. We were biking beside dozens and dozens of geese yeah. on the Missouri, oh. you know, and, and their their trail system is phenomenal yeah. there in Great yeah. Falls. Yeah. So really, you just need a place to meet. You could <laughs> you could take kids out there and and show them a lot of wildlife and waterfowl. I think on just that stretch of their mm -hmm. wonderful trail system. Well, and that's such a big component of what we do in Billings. We do classroom curriculum in fourth grade. It's called ANTS. It's a Audubon Naturalist in the School. Um, but a big part of that is a field trip component to our center. So if we were, let's say, to go to Helena or Great Falls in the next few years, we pilot these programs. We need to partner. You know, we could partner with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks right here in Helena and use the Wild Center. Mm -hmm. Or, like you mentioned, right where you were, Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center. Maybe we partner with the Forest Service. So I think we're, we're trying to be strategic if we were going to mm -hmm. expand. That we certainly don't want to build more buildings, um, but we do want to have opportunities for those experiences to happen. Yeah, great. So what does it look like, uh, just sort of Montana Audubon on the ground? Yeah, well, on the ground, I, you know, I always like to say uh, we use ESP, <laughs> <laughs> education, science, and policy. Uh, that's our three-legged stool. So uh, with education, we've talked about the center at length. In science, uh, I said we're celebrating our 42nd year. Well, every year we've added a new important bird area to Montana. So we're up to 42 important bird areas, covering almost 10 million acres in Montana. So. We identify these places uh, similar to like the national parks when they first got started. We're identifying these places that are important. We're focusing our research and study there. Um, so on the ground, you know, there are opportunities to volunteer with us. There are great birders out there uh, to help monitor what we call citizen science, monitoring these IBAs to manage for the health of these birds. How are they doing? Is it breeding areas? Is it migration routes? Uh, so being able to identify those places on a map, we focus our work. Um, in the policy arena, I talked about what we've done in Helena, like with the checkbox, but I just came back from D.C. and I was meeting with Senator Tester and others about, you know, threats to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. That is foundational to Audubon. So we, we still work in D.C. and Helena to make sure that we're, we're pushing policy that protects birds in Montana. Mm -hmm. And so why should people care about birds? <laughs> <laughs> You're asking the wrong person. <laughs> you know, I, I think birds are amazing. I mean, I've, uh, it's been a big part of my la probably last 25 years. Uh, I've been all over the world, seen over 2,000 species. So I'm sort of the b wrong person to ask. But to the general public, I mean, I think birds bring us joy. I, I mean, just you were talking earlier about seeing the mountain bluebirds again, a sign of spring. Uh, Rachel Carson wrote a a great book called Silent Spring, the mm -hmm. idea of maybe one day if we continue, in that case it was DDT, but these threats to birds, could you imagine a spring without the sounds of birds? Uh, so I could have a horrible day at work, 
Usually I don't. But then I go <laughs> home and I see a bird at my feeder, and it, and it just brings joy. Uh, Emily Dickinson said, you know, um, what is it? Hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul. It kind of talks about every time spring comes, it's new hope, it's new excitement. The snow is melting, the birds are back. Uh, and it also gives us a sense, uh, on a more serious note, of the health of our environment. Because if, if their birds aren't coming back, what's going on? And what's happening here? What's happening in South America and Central America where they winter? Um, and that's sort of more of the, what we call the canary in the coal mine. Exactly. The idea that the bird is a way of telling, we're studying black swifts right now in Glacier National Park. Well, Glacier National Park may not have glaciers in 2030. Well, black swifts actually use glacial meltwater and b build their nests behind those waterfalls. Mm -hmm. What happens if those glaciers go away and we don't have that meltwater? What happens to black swifts? If we're not studying now and figuring out what their needs are, that bird may go away. And in the great understanding of the food web, <laughs> mm -hmm. what does that mean for, for the natural world? Yeah. And in the wintertime, we, uh, we call it watching TV when we just sit by the fireplace and watch the bird feeder out there. We've yeah. got, we just have chickadees and crossbills that come in, but oh, those wow. crossbills will just wipe out the feeder <laughs> and you know, there'll be a dozen of them there in a heartbeat and, and then they'll be gone. We won't see them again for yeah. another week or so. Yeah. So let's wrap up on what can people do to get involved and help Montana Audubon? Well, I think get involved, that's the first thing. You know, we, uh, you mentioned earlier on the ground, it's not just about our state office in Helena and our center in Billings, but many of the cities have Audubon chapters that we partner with. So there's nine Audubon chapters right here in Helena. We're working on a project with Last Chance Audubon. So the local folks are involved in the chapter. I'm a chapter member here. I live in Helena. But also we're working on a project, the Golden Eagle Migration Site uh, in the Big Belts. We're working with the chapters. So people may find a way by getting involved with their local chapters, or they may want to get involved with Audubon, become a citizen science and scientist and actually work with us on research. Um, of course, if you live in building, Billings, it's very easy to get involved with our right. center. Uh, but from the support end, as I mentioned earlier, we don't get funding, regular funding. So uh, it is individual donors. So as people think about what they want to give to, and there are so many great causes, consider us. Mm -hmm. And also uh, when they're um, thinking about their estate, maybe mentioning uh, Montana Audubon or talking to us about how we can be a part of that. That would really support us in the long run. Good. And let's hit your dates for the, and I'm sorry, the, I think of it Bird Fest. <laughs> it's short. Fine. Well, let's just call it Bird Fest. Well, no, now we've got it on the screen, so it's wings across the big, big sky. sky. Yeah. And it'll be June 8th through the 10th yep. in Kalispell. Mm -hmm. Registration's up on your website. Just started the other day. Just a few days ago, yes, so it'll be waiting for people to come there. Yeah, we've already filled one field trip. I said we have 25. One I found out this morning is full. So what, what, was the, what was the popular one that filled so I quick? can't remember which remember? one it was. Okay. We have okay. this board on our in our office, and someone ding, 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 and one got filled. Full. I was like, wait, I wanted to go on that one. I guess the executive director has to sign up quick. There you go. <laughs> be on your toes, even yeah. in your own office. Okay, well, that's great. I appreciate you coming in today and telling us all about Audubon. Thanks for having me. You bet. <laughs> and I want to thank everyone for tuning in as always and finding out about the nonprofits that make our state so great. So thank you for tuning in.